the works of Christ, he said to his disciples, he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show them again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in thee. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothes are in king's houses. But what went ye out? to see a prophet. Yea, I say unto you, you're more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Bird, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, read to you uh, Matthew 11, verse 1 to 11. May God bless the reading to hear the rule of his word. Right now, 
But in spite of the crisis, we still have the crisis. We still sit on the throne. Lord, well, things seem like they're okay out here, but you are still in control. And then, oh Father, help us all to realize that all things work together for the good. For them that love the Lord and follow the Lord and leave a purpose. And oh Lord, right now, we ask that you would be with those that are sick, that are on their beds of affliction. Remember Sister Wayne Ferguson and all of us who are sick. Remember the Ferguson family, oh Father. Give them the strength that they need, Lord. And then, Father, we ask that you would remember Sister Tiffany Carol Curtis Jones. Lord, our Father was taken recently. And it's on the day like today that it's going to be hard for her to deal with the situation that she's facing. But have we realized that you have gone through no time? You've never made a mistake. And oh, Father, you can come and strengthen her and her family at this time. We just thank you right now. We thank you because there is no other one that we can pray to and know that our prayers will be heard and our prayers will be answered. And then, oh, Father, we pray to someone today. Whether they are in the service, by the phone, or whatever means of communication, that their lives will be touched by your word. And if they don't know you, they'll walk in their sins. Oh Lord, we ask that they will turn their life over to you. We thank you right now. We praise your name.
year reaching anniversary.
26th chapter, verses 19 through 20, to pray for him, that utterance may be given to him, that he may open his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which he was an ambassador in chains. That in it he may speak boldly as he ought to speak. Paul was a man's man and God's faithful servant, ready to die for the call of Christ and the gospel. He was an ambassador in chain. But when I stop and look around today, I can't help but conclude that our ambassadors were still in chain. Having been in the ministry this month, 36 years myself, you believe me when I tell you that you know not of the tears, the blood, the sweat, the lonely hours, the heart, the heartaches, the headaches, the back sets, the setbacks, the discouraging words. The smiles, the frowns, all the backstabs, the preacher, the pastor, the ambassador encounters. Yeah. Too many times we unjustifiably criticize the preacher, the pastor, and the ambassador. Okay. Nothing he seems to do satisfy anyone. Yeah. If the pastor is young, the first thing they will say, you know our pastor needs a little more experience. Yes. If his hair turns a little gray, you know our pastor sure is getting old. If he got five or six children, you know our pastor got too big a family. If he has no children, our pastor's not just not setting a good example. If he preaches long, ooh, he sure is winning. If he doesn't preach long, our pastor sure is lazy. If he calls church to rule, we don't have nothing but a dictator. If he does nothing about the proficiency of the church, our pastor is nothing but, a, but, a, but an old figurehead. If he try to be friendly, they, so they, they'll, they'll try, try to say they'll say he's trying to flirt. He flirt. And if he don't say anything, they'll say he's stuck up. And if he stop trying to see them, they will say, I wonder what he's doing in there. And if he don't ever come to go to see them, they will say, my house ain't good enough for them. He says, why? There's always something wrong in change. I tell you, that's why we just heard, Pastor, ain't no need to try to please people. You got to please God. And this is not always easy. But over the years, Watch them carefully observe these qualities in our pastor's life and ministry even before I came here. He has loved people. He has shared the gospel with me. And by God's grace, had the privilege to experience God's working in and through people as they humble themselves and accept Jesus as their Savior. He is an, he is an ambassador for Christ. He has paid careful attention to and devoted his life to the scriptures. He has taught the scriptures in order to exhort others to grow in godliness. He has done it without complaint. Why? Because he loves his Lord and the Lord's people. He truly understands Hebrews 13, 17. That is, to watch over God's people, knowing he will one day give an account for them. And he does it with joy. Thank you, Pastor, for your example. Thanks for being appalled to this temple. Today, celebrating our 36th preaching anniversary, um, we thank all of the members of this church who have been so kind to me throughout these 36 years. And 
Thank you for your phone calls, your cards, and your words, your gifts of love, your words of encouragement on this journey. I just want to thank all of the members of Mountain Church. I love you so dearly and I miss you so much. And uh, just thank you so much. I want to say happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. wonderful, wonderful day today of our fathers. It was once said by a small boy to say Father's Day is just like Mother's Day only you don't spend as much money on the gift. Right. And then one father said well what gift? <laughs> so, you know um, a lot of times fathers have a rough time but I want to just say today that fathers are so important yes, and there are many many good fathers around who don't get the spotlight that they should get today i want to celebrate those fathers who are doing it the right way if you will permit me i would like to express my gratitude to my father this morning who is here today and after He's 83 something, some 80 something years plus, whatever he, he don't ever want nobody to know how old he is, how young he is, but he's still here with us and we thank God for that. He is our sage, he is our father. I have so many brothers and sisters across the length and breadth of our nation because everybody called my daddy daddy. <laughs> so I just thank you. Him for just being a wonderful father uh, to me, uh, for being my daddy. Coaches, 
down through the years. I, I, I thank my dad for coaching me and teaching me how to be a man. Teaching me how to have a relationship with God. Teaching me how to have uh, respect for the Lord's day. Teaching me how to, to be involved in reading the word of God and in, in the structure of the word of God. I mean, yes, it's good to go fishing. Yes, it's good to do all these other things, but 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 then a father who can transfer from the physical things of life yes. to the spiritual things of life and blend them both together is so good. And my dad has been so gracious in being a father like that. Yes. Yeah. We need to appreciate fathers for the faithful instruction that they give us in life for yes. all the good advice. That they give. My father has, has been not only to me, but so many others. We call him our savior yes, because he is a man of wisdom and he gives us instructions and gives us the right thing to do. So yes. thank you, Dad, for material possession. Thank you yes. for faithful instruction. The father who want to. Say thanks yes. for being a godly illustration. Yes. By this I mean uh, uh, a godly illustration for life. Yes. A godly example for life. Yes. In First Corinthians 11, what Paul said to the Corinthians who were his children in the faith, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Notice Paul didn't say do everything I do. No, he didn't say do everything I do. He said do everything I do which is Christ's life. Uh, follow the examples of Christ. Paul was not perfect and neither are we as fathers. But there are, there are some things that I've done in life that I don't want my son to do. I'm sorry when I'm giving him a bad example, but I've also done some good things. I've also done some godless things. I've also done some Christ-like things, which I hope you'll copy from my life. And the most important thing is to love God and love people. Yes. We are today both our earthly fathers and our heavenly fathers. So fathers, keep your mind. Keep giving faithful instruction. Keep the mind a godly illustration. And may God continue to bless you and keep you. Here's my prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for all the fathers today. We thank you, Lord, for for those who have put their hands in your hand, that they may be the priests of their household, that they may lead their family in a godly direction. We pray for spiritual fathers. We thank you for those fathers who have provided material provisions, who have been giving faithful instructions and hands. Thank you for those fathers who have been godly illustrations of what a Christian.
young man is a gifted young man who can rightly divide the word of truth. He has soul sense, style, and scholarship. He is a graduate of Truett Seminary of Baylor with his master's degree, working on a PhD in Roman letters, and just a wonderful, uh, gifted young man. You will be blessed today if you open your heart and ears to hear what God has to say through our preacher, the one and only Reverend Christopher. God. If you lift your hands toward the screens, lift your hands toward God, and I ask that you will pray with me that God will anoint him with preaching power. I ask that God will speak to your area of spiritual need. Will you just pray that prayer? Lift up in God before you right now. Lift. Lift them before the Lord. Lift them before the Lord right now. Lord, we thank you that you will hear the prayers of the righteous. For the prayers of the righteous are very much. We ask for your anointing on here, and we ask for a special blessing that you will speak to our hearts, speak to our soul right now. Now, may the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts. Be accepted in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive now, Reverend Christopher Cole. So that's my 
journey. See, Paul Kalanithi always had an interest in two major subjects. He loved science and he loved writing. The valedictorian of his high school, a man of Indian descent and nationality, Paul Kalanithi would be the valedictorian of his high school and go on to the prestigious Stanford University where this two areas of interest would come to play again. He would major, double major, in English literature and in biology. Doing well at Stanford, he still had these two dual goals and focus. He would go on from Stanford University and then go on to graduate school and get a master's degree in English literature. Then he would go on to get another master's degree in the philosophy of science and medicine. Paul Kalanithi had two dual interests in science and in writing. And then as he finished his graduate studies and had two, two, two bachelors and two masters, he would decide what to do with the rest of his life and he pondered on going to get a PhD in English literature. But then he decided not, he decided to take the easier route and instead enrolled in Yale Medical School in neurosurgery. All right. And so Paul Kalanithi decided to join Yale's medical school and study neurosurgery. Yeah. And having completed Yale Medical School in four years, where he would meet his other, his other half, his wife, Dr. Also, Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. They would then retreat from Yale and go back to Stanford, California, where he would become a neurosurgical resident at, at the same hospital. Oh. And it would be that during his neurosurgical residency, during his final year, the last 10 years of his life have been devoted to studying medicine from four years at Yale to six years at Stanford, to his final sixth year at Stanford, he would write these words in his book. That one of these days, I was looking at these CT scans, and the diagnosis seemed very obvious. The lungs were matted up with innumerable tumors, the spine was deformed, and a full load of the liver was simply obliterated. He had stared, stared at CT scans over and over and over again for the past six years. He had examined so many of them, but this time there was one difference. The scans that he was looking at was his very own. That me and his wife, Dr. Lucy, would ask him the question, do you think that it could be something else? And then Paul would look at his wife and say, tell her, no. They knew exactly what that was, having studied medicine for all those years. And in the final six years of his residency, he knew the diagnosis was simple, stage four lung cancer. Wow. And Paul Kalanithi would write these words that as he would walk into that room, he would pass by the nurse's station, which the nurses that he knew by name, in a hospital that he had spent countless of years and hours working in, that he would walk into a room that he had counseled hundreds and hundreds of patients in, that he would look at these scans that he had looked at so many times, and he would sit in that room, but this time, not as a person wearing a white robe, but Paul Karanthi would sit in that room this time as a patient. Yeah. With a white bandage on his hand and a hospital gown, and he would hear these words, you have stage four lung cancer. And this will prompt Dr. Paul Kalanithi to write this book entitled, When Breath Becomes Air. That it would, he would know that there comes these times in life where we too would have to sit in rooms that we never thought we would imagine ourselves. Where to lie in those same bed that we have made. Where in those times where everything that we stood on, that we talked about, that we believed on, life will come knocking at our door to see how well do you believe what you said. You talk the talk, but how well are you going to walk the house? And Paul Kalanithi would write when breath becomes air to show us how to get through those times where we have to walk out 
about everything that we said we believed and lived. And who can know about when breath becomes air more than John the Baptist? Matthew chapter 11 begins with Jesus preaching and teaching in the city and towns of Galilee. And Jesus' ministry is now unfolding now. He has just commissioned his 12 disciples to go out and preach and teach. And not just preaching and teaching, but to go out to heal all diseases and cast out all demons and sickness. And Jesus is casting out demons and sickness and his disciples are going out. And his public ministry is going out full force. And while that is going on, John catches wind of what's happening. And John has a message that he wants to send to that Jesus of Nazareth, that Jesus whom he met previously before. He sends a message to Jesus, and it's simply in verse number three. He wants to ask him a question. Are you the one to come? Or should we expect someone else? It seems like a question of inquiry, just a, a curious question. It's one that we all have thought about before. Are you the one? Anybody who's ever proposed or been married before, you know that question. Are you the one? And Jesus is asked this question from a delegation of two disciples. Are you the one to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now this is one of those times where Nouns and verbs really matter. And it seems like it's one of inquiry, but if you will read it in its most literal sense, this question is one of those that really comes across more as a statement. Not a question of inquiry, but a declarative statement that are you the one? That's the question. Or should we go looking, waiting, expecting another? Are you the coming one or coming us, the one who we've been waiting for, the one whose arrival we've been expecting, the one who the Old Testament has prophesied. Are you the coming one, the one whose arrival that we've been all waiting for and hearing about from all Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah to Moses? Are you the one to come? Or should we another Heteron, another of a different kind. Should we look for someone else different? Or should we wait, look, expect, or should we be out searching for another? And John would ask these questions to Jesus himself, and it would catch us by surprise. And if you don't understand what's going on with this passage right there, then I'm right along with you. It seems odd that John would ask a certain question like that. But whenever I reach a part in Scripture, when I don't understand what's going on, I learn in elementary school that it's best to ask these simple questions to gain understanding of any story. Who, what, when, where, why? And ladies, it's Father's Day, but it's best to ask and whenever you don't know how to explain a long story, just get simply to the point. Who, what, when, where, why? And, and when you ask who, what, when, where, and why, it can help you understand the story just a little bit better. Who is what we talk about? We're talking about John the Baptizer. John, who was prophesied by the angel Gabriel, the John, who's the son of Elizabeth, the relative of Mary, John, who they said him, they prophesied from the son of Zacharias, who was a priest, John, who whose birth was forecast, even though his parents were of old age. We're talking about John, who leaped in the womb when he came across Mary, even in the Gospels early on. We're talking about John, who they said that he no strong wine or no fermented drink. John, whom they said that he would come in the spirit of an Elijah. John, who they said he would have the Holy Spirit upon him since birth. John, who had called out all those people back to repentance. John, who was told that he was going to call Israel back to their God. John, that desert prophet, as my professor would say. John, who dressed like yesterday but sounded like tomorrow. John, that Yes, a prophet who will prepare ye the way of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. That's who we're talking about now. John, 
who had his ministry out in the desert, and he would preach that one sermon, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And all people from Judea and all from Jerusalem and all from the Jordan would make their way out to hear this desert preacher preach to them about preparing the way of the Lord. This is the John who we speak of, and he was so successful that he had one sermon, prepare ye the way of the Lord. One sermon with three points. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Point one, repent. Point two, be baptized. And this was so effective, he baptized so many people at the Jordan River that John became known as the baptizer. And as his ministry grew and all kinds of people came to hear him preach that one sermon, it got so it got so exciting that the people of Israel started to ask him the question, John, are you the one? Are you the Christ? Are you the one we've been waiting for? And John, who had two points, had to add a third point. No, I'm not the one. I'm not the Christ. But there is one coming whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. Yes, and this is the John who we're talking about now. And this is the John who has been prophesying and speaking and jumping in since before he was even born. This is the John who's asking Jesus, are you the one to come or shall we look for another? But that's the who. What was said was that. Are you the or shall we look for another? When was he said? And verse 1 tells us when it was said, it was said right after Jesus finished instructing his disciples. Right. And after he finished instructing his disciples, it's when John would send that message to him. But can I give you one little detail? Not the who, not the what, not the when, but there's one detail that gives us the key to unlocking the mystery of the entire Matthew chapter 11 statement. And it's simply not in the what, the who, not even in the when, but simply in the where. Verse 2 tells us that when John heard this, where is John? John is in a very unique place. Verse 2 tells us while John was in prison, See, John was in prison. Yeah. And we all know if a preacher is in prison, something ain't right. John is in prison not for doing anything murderous, not from breaking the law, but for preaching what was right. And John, who had no fear about anyone who never withstood any problem or issue, he preached what was right, and now he's in jail, yeah. locked up. And all of this is happening while Jesus' ministry is going forth. Jesus has a message to John while he's in prison. And John is in prison, and Jesus has a message to his disciples. Go back and you tell John. Tell John what it is that you hear and what it is that you see. Go back and tell John that verse number five. Go tell John that the lame that they're walking. Go tell John that the blind that they now have their sight. Go tell John that those who are deaf now can hear. Go tell John not just that, but those that who are dead, who have been dead, are now risen up again. And Jesus goes down the list of five things that are happening right now as he speaks. Go back and tell John that the blind can now see and. Go back and tell John that the deaf can now hear and. Go back and tell John that the lame can now walk and. Go back and tell John that those who are dead are now raising up again. And don't forget about the poor. Don't forget them too. Go back and tell John that and. Now the poor have the good news preached to them. And then he has a final word to John. Blessed is he who does not fall away on account of me. And Jesus gets at the root of what's happening in John's life. And that's something for all of us now. How do you fare? How do you fare? How do you handle life when all of these things is happening around you? When God seems to be happy 
helping the lame to walk and helping the blind to see and the deaf to hear and raising the dead and like when God is doing so many miraculous things around you except in your situation. How do you fare when God is blessing everybody except you? That all this is happening around you while John is simply locked up in prison. And Jesus has a word that he wants to send to John. Blessed is he who does not fall away. That word scandalous, do not fall away. Don't stumble. Don't desert. Don't turn away. Don't quit. Don't retract your statement. John has often preached one thing his entire life. And John is now retracting his entire one thing sermon in this part in his prison. Jesus has to turn and send that message to John, but then he also does something else in the next verse, number seven. He gives an eternal meaning, an eternal significance to the life of John. He turns to the crowd and tells them, Where did you go out into the desert to sit? A reed swayed by the wind? Where did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? What did you go out to the desert to see? A prophet? No, I tell you, more than a prophet. And Jesus gives the eternal significance that John is the one whom it was prophesied that God told, even back in the Old Testament, that I will send my messenger before you. And he will prepare the way of the Lord. That's who you heard out there. He gives the eternal significance, the eternal meaning of the life of John. And he tells them, blessed is he who does not fall away on account of him. There's coming a time where all of us will have to sit and go through those same type of experiences. Now yours might not look like mine. And mine might not look like yours. But we all have a time where we'll have to sit in those rooms that we never thought we would sit in. That we'll have to lay in those beds that we've been making up. That all those things that we preached about and we've stood for, life is going to come knock at your door and say, it's your turn to see if you really want to stick with it. And then when it comes to us, we have to remember that blessed is he who does not fall away on account of you. Did you, can I finish with Dr. Paul Klein? Did you know his book, Top of the Charts for 68 Weeks, that he was one of the best-selling authors? And I'm calling it a book. It was even referenced by Oprah. So if you know, if you make Oprah's reading list, you must have been somebody. And millions of people have read his book, When Breath Becomes Air. And Paul Kalanithi would finish his own even neurosurgery and become a, a doctor of neurosurgery. And Paul Kalanithi would have a baby daughter and he would write these words that life is not about avoiding suffering, but you can find meaning through suffering. Life is made clearer. In, with suffering, not trying to avoid it. We can try to ignore all the bad things in life, but his book will help so many people find meaning through their mortality. And can I tell you one more thing about Paul Kalanithi? Can I tell you, he was diagnosed at the age of 36, but on May 9th, he would die at age 37. That his book, When Breath Becomes Air, was so Outlived even his own life. That Paul Kalanithi, words will be there to help us grapple with our own experiences with death. And his transition from doctor to patient will be the book that inspires millions to make meaning out of their mortality. But can I tell you another transition Paul Kalanithi had? He had a transition from not just doctor to patient. But he had another transition from ironclad atheist to a believer. See, Paul Kalanithi, when after he was diagnosed with stage four cancer, he see right in his book that he found so much comfort in the writings and the words of scripture. And that which led him to loose his hold of atheism, that he would find comfort in these words of Jesus. And who you all know this, that if you can't find, you can't deal with suffering unlike with any other book, scripture does with him. Ain't nobody knows that there's no book that deals with death 
and conquers death like our scripture does. Paul, commodity a man of ignorant descent, would rather help people deal with their mortality. And he was a brown man who helped millions of people come to grips with death. But can I tell you something else? I know of another brown man who helped us deal with our mortality and taught us how to deal with our suffering. He would tell us that blessed is he who does not fall away on account of me. Now this brown man, he might not been a medical doctor, but they talk about this brown man, they say he's a doctor that never lost a case. Now he might not be the brown man who had a degree in neurosurgery, but this brown man that I'm talking about, they would say he's a heart fixer and he's a mind regulator. But this brown man, Paul Kalanity, taught us how to deal with death, but I know another brown man who told us that blessed is he who endures to the end, that he who endures to the end shall be saved.
Amen. Mountain Church, I want you to know that I love you and I 